we are here to sort of talk today about the relationship between an executive and a filmmaker and a creative. And Brian and I have known each other a long time. And uh, if you, any of you are getting confused, I'm the suit, um, <laughs> and Brian is the filmmaker. Um, and we're here in Edinburgh, and it was fun. I arrived yesterday, and one of uh, my colleagues, he said to me, this is fantastic. There's so much going on. There's a, there's a television festival, there's a comedy festival, uh, there's a book festival, there's a theater festival, and there's a tattoo festival. Um, <laughs> and he said there were all these guys on the plane with like lots of ink. Um, and I had to explain to him that actually it was a military tattoo. Um, and then I didn't actually know what a military tattoo was. I knew that that's what the festival was. I still don't know what a military tattoo is. I was telling Brian that's more than I was excited because I actually got, I have an X-Men tattoo. So you're the first people to ever see my X-Men tattoo. <laughs> so, thank you. I don't know why that gets an applause, but uh, what is a military tattoo? Yeah, so we wanted to, what is yeah, a Does anyone know? Can anyone help tattoo? us with that? Marching yeah, bands? It's marching bands, but why? And why is it called a tattoo? Mm -hmm. I think a tattoo is a drum roll. Mm. Um, well, we're very happy to be here. We've known each other for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember my first memory of Brian. I was uh, a young executive at Fox, and I was sent to, I was doing something called acquisitions, where you go and look for independent films to buy. So I'd been sent to the Sundance Film Festival, and I saw Public Access, and I thought it was an astonishing film by a, a young first-time filmmaker. And at that time, in order to try and reach somebody, they had like, these little mailboxes in the main um, part of the festival. There were no cell phones or anything like that, so they couldn't so, communicate with anyone on the slopes. So I remember like, writing some really flattering letter to, to Brian and like, putting it in his mailbox. Um, to see if he'd like call me back or, or find me. So that was my first memory of you know, seeing Brian's film and sort of trying to track him down. And my first memory is opening up and finding one letter in my mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> and um, literally, there was actually one from an executive from a major studio. And I had made this small film, and it coincided, by good fortune, I won the festival a year, but um, I was so nervous and excited to go on to the 20th Century Fox lot and I met with Peter, who was junior executive. Could you, not have been more junior. Yeah, it was mm. very, uh, to me, it would have been like, it's a cool office, nicer than my dad's, but it was still a quite narrow office, as I, as I remember it. And, and, um, and, I, 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 and I loved, I thought Peter was quite adorable and had quite an adorable accent. And, I, and, and yet there was nothing else in the office except for the, there was a, um, a little picture on the wall uh, uh, from the Coen Brothers movie, Mill Miller's Crossing. It was like a, like a picture, like a still from the movie. Yeah. And I, I, re I just remember saying, oh, Miller's Crossing, you like the Coen Brothers. And that began what started as more of a sort of, what felt like a formal meeting yeah. into a conversation between two, to me, the human, like, two, like someone I could get to know. As a person. And that was kind of my shtick at the time. Like, I'd get to go to film festivals, <laughs> and like, I couldn't have been more junior. And I met this whole generation of, you know, new storytellers. And invariably, I could be the first person from a major studio to say, I liked your stuff. Um, and I always thought that was pretty meaningful because I think when people go to film festivals and they suddenly become the flavor of the month, like, you would mm -hmm. have come back from Sundance and you'd won, you'd won the grand jury prize and all of a sudden there was probably 20 or 30 meetings that you have across town. The, there was less so. It, the, the year I won the Sundance Film Festival, for those of you who don't know, it's the largest sort of uh, American film festival. It, it wasn't as big and famous as it is now, but they had four judges, so they actually split the grand jury prize to two different filmmakers. So I had to actually share the grand jury prize with an another film called Ruby in Paradise, which was more of an independent kind of confidence story. Ashley Judd was the star, it was her debut, and, and so that film kind of got distribution. Mine was a strange, esoteric, very David Lynchian kind of movie. 
So it, it didn't get that kind of, the kind of attention that maybe a sex lies in video, another kind of, uh, or a, uh, what's the, uh, the latest, uh, the um, whiplash, which I, cause I was on the jury for that, um, got. So, so there wasn't as, this cavalcade of, of attention. The meeting was probably more meaningful than Peter realizes for me at the time, I was, and I was probably more nervous than I appeared. Or I appear now. <laughs> Uh, so then we'd kept, and I thought it sort of started a relationship where, you know, we've been friends now for 25 years, and we keep in touch even if we're not uh, working directly with each other on things. Um, and over that period of time, I was always looking for things to work, you know, with Brian on, and um, you know that started with X Men, you know, which was a few years later. It was after he'd made you'd made Usual Suspects, and. You know, we're now working on, on Legion together and another X-Men TV um, series that we're developing. But it's interesting, I think, the idea of what a relationship between you know, the suit you know, and the talent is. Mm. You know, the, the cliche about it is that it's a very um, adversarial mm -hmm. relationship. And I've never found this, although I, I was recently um, writing a, a speech, and we have the, the great fortune when you work in the entertainment business, if you're writing a speech, you can always give it to like a world-class comedy writer to punch up. I and I'd written this thing about living my life in the world of storytelling and working with storytellers and helping them to shape their stories. And I'd written sometimes make it better. Mm -hmm. um, and then this writer had written in parentheses, or oh, that's what I tell them. Um, <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well. Uh, so what does it feel like to you from your side of well, I've always asked that. I think filmmakers inherently want to, um, it's the nature of a filmmaker and their desire to be viewed as an artist or an, uh, an auteur, I guess, if you want to use that expression, um, to distance themselves from the studio in terms of the finished product. This was my vision, my film. I created that. And in essence, you work with a huge collaboration, your crew, your producers, your writers, and, and, uh, um, and as well, the studio. In the end, the reality is you, it begins with the studio's faith in giving you money to make movies, particularly big movies, which cost a lot of money. And if you have any respect at all, you'll always keep your guard up because you, in the end, in the end, you're out for the same goal. You both want to make a successful film that people like. So if you start with that mentality, and I kind of, whenever anyone asks me or, 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 or tries to diss the studio, like, oh yeah, the studio, and you, you don't, I, I'm always like, well, you know, some of the notes are good, some don't work, but we work sort of together because we're, we all want the same thing. That's as best as I can say it. I could ramble on about how, you know, how you, and, and, and then the other technique I always try to use when, when, when working with a studio head, or studio executive is, okay, I have my vision and what I want and what I think is best for the movie. I have to get, okay, that, that I know. Now, I'm gonna hear what they want. I may agree with a percentage of it. I may actually take credit for a percentage of it or get credit for a percentage of it if I use it and it's great. But what I also do when I'm hearing that information is I, I do this game where I put myself inside the head of the person who's giving me the notes, of a Peter's head, like why, 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 why would he say, why would he say something like that? Why would he think I should change that, or that's, you know, or do something different? And and I make sure that I don't disrespect, and just look at the note. I also try to imagine that I was them. I try to. I don't put on a, an actual suit because it's too uncomfortable, but I do mentally do that, and that has helped me through dealing with not only people, you know, well, we're friends, but also studio heads who I'm not necessarily friends with, um, but also in dealing in, with the marketeers, the people who are marketing your film, uh, publicizing your film, with the press, who sometimes are, you know, you know can really come at you. So, uh, it's interesting you talked about 
understanding what it is you're trying to achieve in the beginning. I think mm. there's something good in a relationship where you actually have that fundamental agreement going in. I think yes. the only times I've you know, really got into confrontation with anyone is so when you're not really in agreement at the beginning. Because if in the beginning you're in agreement, which is what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And ultimately, studios are in the commerce business, but they're in the commerce of storytelling business. And I think different stories have different goals. Like not every, Usual Suspects was you know, an amazing film. It was never expected to be you know, Days of Future Past or Apocalypse. It's not mm. expected to be a billion dollar um, movie. And therefore, the agreement you have with you know, the money, with the commerce side of it, is different. Mm, yeah, and, and as a result of that, when going into the process, you kind of look at the budget. That's the first, yeah. it's two things. One, what kind of movie are we making? And then if we're make, and, and based on that kind of movie, you, um, you, uh, you then discuss a budget that you both feel is sufficient for the movie. And then that's where you usually come to some, this arguing yeah. back and forth, because you're always fighting for a little more money. But if you fight for too much money, then you kind of put yourself in, in a risky situation where it's like, imagine if, the, if Peter said, okay, here, here's another $50 million. Well, now suddenly your movie makes this much. It's no longer a success because you spent too much. And um, Stacy Snyder is now at the yeah. studio, and I would ha she had previously worked with Steven Spielberg, and she's now at Fox. And we were having this conversation where because Steven Spielberg is so successful and has no uh, limitations, he actually creates something I actually used to do, oddly enough, when I was a bit younger, these self-imposed limitations, mm -hmm. where you say, okay, this movie should not cost more than this amount of dollars. And um, I think the biggest, conf the toughest one you, we ever had was on X-Men 1, yeah. because there were no comic book movies at that time. They had died off, and there was no template. And I wanted as much money as possible, and the studio was willing to go to a certain amount. And um, I mean, you were, I mean, you were not. $75 million, I think. It was a box, yeah. yeah. Bill Mechanic was the chairman. He called it the box. <laughs> And, uh, and we got it, it started at 91 million, got down to 87 million, 60 million, and finally we brought in the final budget, 78 million. That's it, so we got it down to 78, isn't that great? And Bill was like, 75. <laughs> and my life- And then studios do this thing where, and I was the studio, <laughs> you want it to be less, but you want all the good stuff in the script. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. nobody wants to let that go, oh yeah. Because the only way to really cut a budget is you have to cut the script. And you have to tell the story in a different way. And you can tell stories in lots of different ways. Um, but you, know, you fundamentally, you know, studios fall in love with moments like mm -hmm. everybody else does. And they, many times, might be an expensive moment. And that's what you're saying, well, we could cut that. Well, no, you can't cut that. But it's still going to be 75. Yeah, and that's where we get into this game of, of sort of like, and it, where I'm like, OK, well, I know what scenes they don't want to cut. And, but I keep, uh, now we're getting into like, oh, it's, it's terrible because there is, some, there is some manipulation that happens where the studio finds- Who's play, manipulating who? Well, well <laughs> it, 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 go, it goes back and forth. I mean, I can tell you one on X-Men 2 because you, were, you had already moved to Searchlight yeah, when I, I did X-Men 2, so you don't they get to be, but the chairman had this scene that he just loved but it was, a, it was a scene that didn't have to be in the movie for the story to work. And it was $600,000. And, and yet we had to get that budget down. And I just kept saying, well, well I'm just going to cut that scene, knowing that I love the scene too. It's a sexy scene. It's got like all these, it's the tent scene in there, and the, the tent in the X-Men 2. It's, go back and watch it. Anyway, um, and I kept that in my back pocket as a kind of a strange, I don't say weapon, but sort of a device to say, look, if push comes to shove dollars, the story has to make sense. Stories, to me as a filmmaker, always have to make sense. So I'll cut the $600,000 scene. And that became, OK, well, let's, and so Tom and I, Rothman, who's the chairman at the time, and I battled over where to cut. And I always had that in my back pocket. And in the end, he conceded to certain budget things. And I shot the scene. 
But they kept moving the scene up in the schedule to make sure it so got it shot, shot, I kept noticing. <laughs> And developing... Um, are you aware, I'm curious, are you aware of these kinds of things that film make, like when a filmmaker's trying to hold on to something, or how do you, f or what's your feeling? You know, yeah, I think you're aware. Way. I think you're aware of what's meaningful in the storytelling to people, and there are little games that go on in terms of budgets and schedules and where things are placed. Um, you know, people are ultimately, lots of bad movies are made in the world, lots of bad television shows are made. Everybody goes into them wanting to make something great. You know, I've, I don't really find um, Hollywood to be as cynical as it's portrayed in the world. Um, there are, the only movies I've ever regretted making or television shows are ones where I feel that I was cynical, I had that sense of like, well, I don't particularly like it, but they will like it. And I always found that they, you know, which is the audience, couldn't be smarter. Like on mm. mass, they are so smart, and they they find that cynicism, you know, instantly. And that's when things does, don't work. Other shows and other movies I've I've made or worked on um, that haven't worked, we've all gone into them wanting them to work, wanting to make a great piece of art, um, and that is just the swings and roundabouts of how things, you know, how things have, have gone. You know, I don't, I don't regret things that I've made that I'm proud of and I think are um, really good, even if they haven't connected with an audience. That's important, that's great, that's nice to, that's cool. Because it's the big scary thing, because you, you, never, you never know, Woody Allen's famous quote, the audience never lies, yeah. is, is very important. You, you, you never know what in the end the audience is really gonna like on that day in that month, yeah. at that at that year, and uh, if everyone, if you knew that, then how do you pick the stories to work on? Like, how do you pick something which interests you and excites you? I think each one is different. There's got to be something in the main character or in the story that I connect to. Uh, I have a knack for ensembles, so I like groups of people. It's more to cut to. Uh, I. Um, in X-Men, each one is individual. In X-Men, uh, it's just that feeling of being isolated. I was kind of, you know, I had issues, uh, you know, growing up with being uh, not a good student, a nerd, uh, sexuality issues, whatever they were. And, and I identified with the X-Men characters as being outcasts. So I responded to that. And then from there, it grew into, wow, this is a cool universe. This is cool, cool stuff. But I always knew. I wanted to make the movies that I waited on a line to go see as a kid, big budget action adventure movies. And I remember, uh, I reflect upon a moment where there was early screenings, early versions, cuts that were long, that were not so good of the first X-Men movie. We, and there was no other comic book movies, so we weren't sure whether it was gonna work. And since Peter was my only real friend, you know, at the studio, like there was a friend besides uh, a, a, a boss, essentially, and um, I took a walk through the parking lot outside Building 88, which is the production building at Fox, and, and it was just the two of us, I don't know if you, I, you may not remember this, and I looked at Peter and I said, Peter, almost as a therapist, because there was no answer he could give me, uh, I said, if this film fails financially and critically, I will never be able to make one of these again. I'm really afraid of this, and I have to tell you that. And he said, something <laughs> like, well, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And then we went back inside. How, in how inspiring of me. <laughs> you told me you were going to say that thing, but you didn't tell me what my punchline was. Yeah, I, didn't, that's, that's, I don't think, I think you, uh, yeah. It was interesting when we were developing that. Um, oh. Brian, well, Brian taught me so much about developing a story. He has this... Um, really focused technique when he's developing something, and he's pretty demanding of writers, um, pretty hard on writers. Two of which are in the, three of which are in the audience right now. Um, they know exactly what I mean, what he, he means. He I mean. has this unerring ability to, he looks at scenes, and he says, well, why does that person do that? You know, over and over and over again, and what am I going to tell the actor in, on the day, on the set, 
Why are they doing that? And I think it's the strength of his movies, even when they're um, visual effects movies, that they're ultimately really human because he always brings it back to the actor. And I think it's why actors love to work with you. And I don't know where that came from in terms of that focus for you on what do I tell the actor? Because yeah. ultimately the actor's the person on the screen who's, who you have to um, convey the movie through. Yeah, I remember making my first short film called Lion's Den, which was about five friends who meet in a diner and have a realization about the falling apart of their relationships as young men. And one of them was Ethan Hawke, who had grown up in my neighborhood and acted in some of my eight millimeter movies. And he said something very profound to me. At that time, he was, I think, a teenager. But he had already done uh, Dead Poet Society, and it hadn't come out yet. And he said to me, he said, actors equal production value. And that, that expression never has left me. You can blow up a million buildings or destroy, you know, have a million robots attack, whatever. But if you have the right actor, whether it's uh, Jack Nicholson, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet, whomever, um, or the wonderful actors I've been, we've been blessed to work with, um, give you the right emotion and the right truth in a scene, the audience is just like on the edge of their seat just as much as they would be if a tidal wave was coming. And that's cheap. I mean, not, some actors aren't that cheap. <laughs> but this is, the, and to get that, you need to be able to answer those questions. Yeah. Why am I, Professor uh, Patrick Stewart, why am I in this wheelchair? Who put me here? Did I ever tell you what he, when he asked me that? Uh. I don't know if you're X-Men, but in the early X-Men, Patrick Stewart played Professor X, and he said, he said, Brian, why am I in this wheelchair? <laughs> and I said, well, I think years ago, your friend slash enemy, your frenemy, Magneto, I think he put you in that wheelchair. I don't know how, but he did it. He did something. That's why you're in that wheelchair. He goes, well, what does it say in the comic book? Well, in the comic book, it says that, that after traveling to Israel, Professor Xavier went to Tibet, uh, where he encountered an alien agent named Lucifer. Um, who had holed up in a castle. And so uh, Xavier rallied the Tibetans, fighters that they are, to assault this castle. And this angered Lucifer, and he dropped a rock on the professor, and that's why he's in the wheelchair. And Patrick just looked at me and said, I like your version better. <laughs> said, okay, we'll go with that one for now, okay. And then years later, I was able to circle back to it with producing and writing the story for uh, X-Men First Class, which you got to see that actually happen. So. With, my, with different actors. But. And not the Tibetan version. No, the, the, <laughs> the Lucifer, we haven't got to Lucifer yet. <laughs> and how do you find television storytelling to be different from um, movie storytelling? Wow, that, you took one of my questions. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, um, well, I have a I mean, we've both worked in both mediums. Yes. So yeah. I've. Um, and you before me, because you made House um, mm. before when I was still at Searchlight, and then we worked together a little on House after I went to, to Fox, which was the network it was on. And I think for me, that sense of, I think movies are ultimately narrative stories mm. in which the characters move the narrative along, but you have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I find that television is almost a character journey in which narrative ultimately informs character, but you're really on this long character journey with people. We were talking about some shows this morning. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, no, and I remember, I, I think I learned the most from uh, Aaron Sorkin and the show The West Wing. Uh, I watched it quite religiously, and, um, and I learned that it, was, it, that it, that it can be organic. Uh, that show began, I think, where the president <clears throat> the United States is going to be a more peripheral character, and then Martin Sheen came and made, it a, a, made himself a more significant character, and the show evolved. But the style of shooting, it occurred to me that for the smaller screen, it's more about what the audience is hearing than what they're seeing. So I should not sit here and be so obsessed with my visual style. I should care, again, more about actors equaling production value. How are they sound, uh, sounding to the audience? Um, what are they saying? It's not a director's medium, it's a writer's medium. Television is a writer's yeah. medium. It, it belongs to the writer, uh, like theater, like a play. 
And, um, and so to understand that right away. So when I sit down to begin a television show, I realize, wow, I'm going to introduce characters that may die when you, you know, kill the pilot, or, just, or they may live on for dec you know, for, for, forever, like The Simpsons, or the, the you know, or, or and, uh, and so I say, I really want to know that I'm on the same page, not only with the studios, uh, the, the producer uh, with the studio, but all uh, and the network, which can be two different entities, mm -hmm. which can be also like House was sure. un, was uh, House was Universal Studios, but on the Fox network. Fox network, uh, but the only you know, ultimately the network has to air it. They're the ones licensing it. They have to put the promotion behind it and really care about it. So the network you really want to focus your 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 partnership with, but you you partner with both, but also with the writer and make sure that the the writer is really you know, believing everything you're deciding. Like I cast, you know, when I, when I cast the show, I want to make sure they love those actors and that, you know, because they're the ones who are going to have to put the words in their mouths. It's different. A film is mine. A TV show will ultimately belong to the writers and the ages. And that's the big difference is the, between um, when I would go to make a movie and a, a television show. I always loved on House. When I went to TV, I remember my son, he was quite young at the time, he was probably seven or eight. He said to me, Daddy, does anyone ever die on house? And I said to him, I was standing in the kitchen, I said, yeah, people die on house. And then I thought about it for a minute and I went, no, actually they don't. He saves them every single week. You know, oh, well, well <laughs> almost, almost, yeah, occasionally we, we uh, very, very, very Rarely, yes. He'll occasionally lose a patient or he'll sacrifice one that wasn't going to make it anyway yeah. just to save another one. But actually, for the beauty, <laughs> I was working on the show at the time <laughs> and the strength of that storytelling and that writing was that it felt to me that, you know, the suspense they created every week was so good that mm -hmm. I thought somebody died every week. It was only when I really started to rationalize that I was like, oh no, he saves them every week. Well, because contrary to some, time, some of its reputation, because possibly the news side of Fox, the entertainment side of Fox is probably one of the most, is, is the most progressive network. They let a lot of stuff go. I mean, crazy stuff be on TV, which is awesome. And we got a lot of freedom on house yeah. to have some pretty scary illnesses and some really shocking sequences. And um, we got away with a lot. And that made you, gave you that tension and that feeling. Sure. And, and we had a great formula, you know, he saves you, he gives you some drugs, you get better, then you get worse, then you get better, you get worse. And, and another thing with television, if it works, don't mess with it too much. Now with serialized television, it gets a little more complex, and maybe you can talk more about, how, how do you view, how, do you think about the procedural, and this also deals with the future. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious of your views of the future of television. The serialized drama, Lost, let's say the TV show Lost as an example, or the procedural drama, which is House, person gets sick, person gets saved, they get better. And then sometimes they merge the two. And now we have Cable, which is you know, very progressive and much more, usually more serialized sure. than Game of Thrones or, or um, a, 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 a Breaking Bad. I think the great thing about television right now is that um, you know, form follows function in some ways and that people's ability to essentially watch anything. You know, you can watch almost anything ever made now, anywhere on earth, you know, mm -hmm. with, the TV, with the TV screen you have in your pocket. And that's freeing in terms of telling story because you can tell serialized stories. You can tell a 70 hour movie now. You were talking about Boardwalk Empire this morning, sort of a, yeah. a 50 hour version of The Godfather. Um, and there's, for writers, there's a, there's a freedom in telling those kinds of stories. Um, and at the same time, if you're doing something that's more procedural, there's a discipline to telling a procedural, which is, you know, you have this, this disciplined form that you have to follow, and every week you have to make it interesting. So the characters have to be so good, and the plots have to be so good, um, that that's a different challenge to writers. And so I think we're living in this amazing age where you know, people are creating new forms. We've started to do these very, very serialized, but one season, mm -hmm. you know, anthological television shows that Ryan Murphy has started doing for us. And when he first said he was gonna do American Horror Story, he pitched this idea of, you know, it's going to be serialized, and 
I'm going to carry the same actors from season to season. And we were very challenged with that when he first pitched it. We thought, well, you know, how's the audience going to react? We didn't, we didn't understand at that point that the actors would be doing such radically different um, you know, characters from season to season. But it's become this amazing hybrid of a serialized show in which you get to follow these actors you love. They're doing wildly different things from season to season. And it's the stories of different time periods, um, but they all have the, a similar tone. Mm. So we did that with American Horror Story, we're gonna do it with American Crime Story now. And I think it does speak to sort of the freedom now for people to you know, make, tell any kind of story that they want. Um, and I think that's really fun for storytellers. I think it's also fun for actors. I mean, mm. now these actors on American Horror Story, they, they get to be like ensemble players. Yeah. Like in the old vaudeville where one day, or the show of show, or, or the, the old variety shows back when we were little kids, when you, one day you were you know, playing a dictator, the next day you're playing a housewife, the next day you're playing you know, a serial killer. And here for that cast, uh, an American Horror Story, of which I've cast Evan Peters, who plays Quicksilver for, for my X-Men film. So Sarah Paulson, was, we were shooting at the same time. In American Horror Story, she's playing a two, you know, a two-headed woman, a woman who's got two mm -hmm. heads. And then in the afternoons, she was shooting, you know, American Crime Story, where she's playing Marsha Clark, the, um, <laughs> the prosecutor. Um, and just the ability to go back and forth like that was really fun. That sounds incredible. Again, that's, that's but I think, I think that, again, is, that's, that's cool. That's fun for, for uh, we were talking because Simon Kinberg and I are doing. Uh, uh, we're developing Twilight Zone for CBS Productions, and we're trying to find a format for it that's unique and different, and yet that celebrates Twilight Zone, but at the same time is something that's for the modern audience. So I was talking at breakfast this morning with Peter about how you know, and just I even I, I want to continue talking about it later because I'm curious to get your thoughts on. On, uh, on it because the audience is different. Also, the way audiences watch movies, I uh, sorry, the way audiences watch television today is completely different. We binge. We gather up our house of cards or, uh, or, uh, or Stranger Things, uh, whatever show, and we uh, get a bunch of episodes and then we just watch 10 at a time, or five at a time, or as many as we can. And so much so that now Netflix, or one of the networks, several of the networks, will have a countdown to the next episode mm -hmm. to sort of encourage you to not shut off your TV and, and just, just keep going, keep going. And that's also, I think we need to, as t makers of this content, have to, uh, or have an opportunity to uh, be thoughtful of that and mindful that the audience may just sit there for five hours and actually experience a journey which I've enjoyed with Boardwalk Empire. I did six hours one night of Boardwalk Empire. I mean, you want to start, you know, you'd be killed. It, you have to watch a cartoon. I do an American Dad and a Family Guy <laughs> to come down, which can be more violent it sometimes. Certainly can. <laughs> um, but, uh, and that, I think that's, that's, it occurs to, that, that's a different thing. That so as a filmmaker who grew up looking at, you know, you've said a lot of times Steven Spielberg's one of your big influences, you know, Jaws was your favorite movie. Looking at these big cinematic spectacles, and now, you know, we talked earlier about virtual reality and different new forms of storytelling and television and, you know, making, mm -hmm. making stories for this screen. Um, does that make you nostalgic? Does it make you excited? Um, you, you always, as a filmmaker, particularly making the big movies, you want, especially when I, I shoot in native stereo, when I do a 3D movie, I actually shoot in 3D with a real 3D camera, uh, 3D rigs. Um, I don't post-dimensionalize it later. Um, you want the audience to experience it that way, in a theater, old school, popcorn, a date, whatever. That being said, I discovered some of my favorite movies on old scratchy VHS copies in a dorm room at the YMCA the size of this table with my friends. And if you know, good, good storytelling is good storytelling. And the definition on that device, if you've got a headset, far exceeds the quality that I experienced in the VHS player we had in the dorms at School of Visual Arts in New York City uh, all those years ago. So if that's how someone wants to experience it, it's their choice. It might, 
I can't worry about that. I have to just worry about the story. And that's why story is so important. And sometimes there are films that uh, make more money or they do bigger business in certain territories, but they don't have a story. They just have a lot of shit happening in them. And to me, I think in the end, for building a library for mm -hmm. you and for the studio and for myself and for my career or my legacy in the long term, for 10 years, if, from when someone decides, oh, oh, I saw something that I didn't know Brian Singer did, I'm gonna click that and watch it on my iPhone this morning and give it 20 minutes. If it's got a story, it's gonna engage you even if it's on that little screen and you don't have headphones on. If it's just a lot of fireworks, well, sure. we could see those over the castle last night. Yeah, I'm ultimately really optimistic about storytelling mm. um, in all these different forms. So virtual reality, so I've seen lots of virtual reality, lots of whiz bang, lots of visuals. One of the best pieces I saw was actually almost like a mini episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which mm -hmm. is our little FX comedy show with yeah, Danny, Danny show. DeVito and Rob McElhane. I know the whole guy. And it was great. And it's like, they used it in a completely different way. Now I was a member of the gang and this, this entire sort of comedy sequence was going on around me and I'm right in the middle of it. And I hadn't even thought about telling story in that way and using virtual reality to tell story in that way um, and to wear the headset, but I'm, there aren't visuals coming at me. I'm, it's not an experience. It wasn't a, um, a theme park ride. It was really human and I was inside something with people that I knew and I wanted to be with. And so I, I think all of these different technologies, once they're used by people who love story, are gonna be fantastic. I think so, that is the future. Where James Cameron brought us into 3D, but said, look, I'm not gonna make it an, uh, uh, an attraction, I'm gonna make it a movie that happens to be in 3D. Um, with virtual reality, I, I had the pleasure recently, I, I, I was flying over to, the, to New York on my way here, and I stopped in Provo, Utah, and I experienced something called The Void, which is the most sophisticated virtual reality system to date in the world, and you actually put on an entire headgear, sound gear, body gear, you're interactive with the person you travel with and you move within an environment so you can actually touch things, sit in chairs, open doors. And they did a Ghostbusters journey and then I did a, um, a Mayan temple journey. And what struck me was exactly what you're talking about is that this is the future. Um, I mean, we could go into a whole VR conversation where VR is the future of journeying to foreign locations or for people who are disabled or elderly who, who, who want to experience things that they may not see, you know, like travel space underwater. But, but in terms of like taking virtual reality and making it into like a t or an episode or a movie, it, 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 it's a new skill set. And I think it requires some exercise. And it's going to be a new generation of writers they may be old writers, but yeah. making themselves into a new generation who actually say, okay, yeah, this is cool, yeah, I know, oh, this is weird, I'm feeling this, oh, but, but what's gonna keep me moving forward and what's gonna keep me laughing and, and what's gonna make me cry and break my heart while I'm wearing this thing on my head and this thing in my eyes and I can look anywhere I wanna look and see things. Uh, and that's, um, but you know, people probably had the same, reaction when television was invented. Sure. Or when the train's coming, that first famous image of people watching the... The train you know, the go, the famous, the yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, French film, the train coming into a station, the first time a film had ever been screened, for those of you who don't know, the first time a film, a motion picture film, had, had ever been screened in, in front of an audience was in France. And it was a train, literally a film of a train coming into a station. And no one had ever seen a film before. So it was projected on a screen like this big, or, and like a big screen, and the whole first five rows of the audience jumped up out of their seats and ran away because they thought a train, train was, was gonna come. coming at them and going to run them over. And suddenly someone had to say, okay, how do I take, okay, this thing that captures life and tell stories with it? So they started to invent the close-up and intercutting and, you know, and, and that's going to that's gonna now happen. It has happened with short format, YouTube, videos. And I love the idea of, you know, for what I do is ultimately look for great storytellers to come and choose to work at Fox. You know, I, everybody in Hollywood, <coughs> and I think this is a good thing. I've, I've done it a few times today. I've said, when I made, 
-hmm. and I've talked about projects that you know we worked on or I worked on, mm -hmm. and I've used the term when I made, but I didn't make any of them. I didn't write them, I didn't direct them, I didn't produce them, I didn't act in them. Um, I was important in, their, um, in them being made. You know, I chose to finance them, we, we distributed them. But I love the sort of, the way everyone in Hollywood does have that sense of ownership. Mm. But what you're really looking for is great storytellers. And how do you invite the best storytellers to come and work at you know, your shop, you know, as opposed to working at Warner Brothers or Disney mm. and you know, the different, because all of the studios do have different personalities. But they, they, they do, and, and, um, and they've grown up with them over, this, over the, the last century. Um, there's, a, there's a big one. The way it happened with us was an incredible story, story if you really think about it. And it's not just the birth of, of X-Men, it's the birth of the modern comic, day, or a comic book movie. Um, X-Men had collapsed. We lost our entire crew. We couldn't get a budget or a script or anything. And at one point, it was myself, my friend Tom DeSanto, and you. Mm -hmm. It's the three of us sitting on the floor at the Spanish Broadcasting Building somewhere in West LA, in an office, a little tiny office, pasting pieces of paper together, trying to construct a story night, together. The night before Thanksgiving. Yes, the night before Thanksgiving. Just the three, on the floor, just the three of us. Maybe you still had a suit on it, maybe you took it off, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I always wear the suit. Okay, that's just to <laughs> just make so sure. Just so we know who, who I am. Who, yeah. It's my identity, it's my costume. Do you like this, Mr. Ray? Um, but but, but we, we did that, we actually did that. We didn't let it go. It, and a lot of people would have just let it go when, when, the, when the budget, we couldn't figure out a story and a budget that worked in the studio, the, the people above you at the time and well above me couldn't, you know, just weren't having it. And then we did that and we took the time and part of that is, references what you said, is we all knew what we were trying to do. We were trying to make a serious, story based in a comic universe and celebrate this big comic book and let's get comic book movies going let's let's take x-men and make it real or uh, into but something. it fundamentally spoke to you on a human emotional personal character driven yes. way and i've been developing that project for maybe five years before yeah so what made you, you know, pick you, me because you, you you i'd offered it and then kept coming back i remember I think, or just really... Well, I'd gotten to know you. Really I thought, I mean, I, I just loved The Usual Suspects. I mean, just the, the ability to deal with an ensemble and tell a mysterious story that had character and action and suspense all working together, you know, felt like the right tone for an X-Men movie. And I felt that with, with a comic book, what we, everyone had been doing... Because the Batman movies were at the end of their cycle at that point, yeah. and they'd really... They'd ha they had a very different tone, and Tim Burton had set up a different tone in the beginning, and then Joel had taken it in a different direction. And the idea of X-Men being real and being taking it seriously and being set in our world. It wasn't set in Gotham City, it was set in our world. And you immediately gravitated to that. So it felt like you had the skill set to do it, but also the emotional connection to it. Oh, well, it's a, uh, I think the important thing is the, that idea that, that there's mutual respect and understanding for what we're trying to do and, the where we, and to roll up the sleeves and actually care mm -hmm. together. Um, if I feel, if I'm sitting in a room with a studio head that doesn't care about the movie, you don't feel they don't get it, either f just let me go, fire me, or tell me why and let's get it together, Let, let's understand it together. Sure. I think we had already had that, then we just now had to figure out how to get it so that the people who had to write the check would, or and the bot, I, you know, I love working at Fox because I think on some level, you know, I think there's been a big corporatization of storytelling in the last 20 years. Um, I think it has a lot to do with international markets growing and visual effects being more important than character. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to make everything look kind of the same. And I think one of the things I love about Fox and working at Fox is a sense of the filmmakers that we work with, you know, you, Jim Cameron, you know, Ryan Murphy, Howard Gordon, Ridley, you know, Ridley, you know 
Bruno Heller, who's going to be here um, later on today. We're looking for people who, they don't do what we tell them. They come in with a really strong point of view, um, and they're looking to do something different and to define it um, uniquely. And I think that is, um, you know, it's why I love work, working there. It's sort of the ethos of, of what we have, trying to say, you know, we have a big, big company. You can make, you know, anything within our company, but we want it to be unique. No, and it does feel, and the, having been in sort of the Fox family since I actually signed the deal to do X-Men in 96, so that's about 20 years, um, and with House as well. As you went and flirted with Warner Brothers for a while. I did, yeah, I hung out over there. <laughs> uh, but again, there, Warner was a very different experience because because uh, um, uh, Warner Brothers part of the Time Warner family. Again, there are pub, there's publishing, there's a studio. Um, I, I mean, I can dissect every single studio, and they have their uh, virtues and efficiencies, I imagine, as every company does, as I do. Um, Fox, perhaps because it's, it, it is family owned, uh, or uh, and and it yet it is it has so many different aspects to it. I mean, there's multiple companies and multiple aspects of which you seem to run so many. I, when I read his resume recently, I was like, is that the same person I met? Like, I freaked out. Um, but you do. It is. It 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 is for a giant studio. It does have a kind of on, entrepreneurial feel. A little bit, you know, you feel like you're at, like at an entrepreneurial place where you can say shit in a room and not feel like it's it's um, there's another arm of a corporation that doesn't care. I think that arm does care. I think that arm wants to see how it's going to work with its arm. TV have the, the our, what we're doing right now with yeah. Legion and with the other X Men television project will relate to future X Men movies, with whether it's Deadpool or whether it's X Men sequels and the past ones that, that I've done. And, and when I saw Days of Future Past when you came back to direct, it was such an astonishing movie. Um, really, the, you know, I loved it so much. And we started to talk then about, well, what would an X-Men TV show look like? Um, and how, could it, how do we ensure that it wasn't a 45-minute you know, attempt to make an X-Men movie? You know, and again, looked for someone who had a really different, idiosyncratic, personal, you know, uh, filmmaking aesthetic, which is how we you came to Noah. With Noah Hawley, yeah. Noah Hawley had done an incredible job with you and um, Fargo, uh, and, and we wanted to make a, a show that would be part of the X-Men universe, but when you watched it, you wouldn't have to label it. You c it, it can exist completely on its own. Uh, and and that, that was very important because if you try to just make X-Men for TV, well, you can't afford the visual effects. You know, a minute of film would cost an episode. So uh, you, it has to exist in that way. And yet, Noah, through his, has created some extraordinary visuals to complement what is, will, will be a, a, a really, really ambitious and fun and very unique uh, storyline. And that yet, yet will still be connected to that universe. Okay. And the same it's, thing with the other part. It's great. He's a, he's, have you read his book? I haven't so, read his book yet. Yeah, no, you've told me He's just about written it. this novel. I, yeah, I know. And it's like, I just it. finished it. It's amazing. You should all go by it. It's called Before the Fall. And he's written this, I guess, in between you know, writing and show running Fargo, writing and show running Legion. Um, and it's just like, oh, I'll just throw off this amazing novel at the same time. Um, so I, I live in sort of awe of. You know, people who can tell story. Um, or just never leave their house. <laughs> <laughs> They're called writers. You know who you are. All three. So, but, uh, um, so what do you see as, um, tell me about sports. I, I, because now you, now, uh, but prior, to, when you were doing television, primarily the entertainment area, now you've brought sports, now you're running sports, which has become, which has such an interesting, I'm just gonna give my take on what's really cool about sports is that it's a narrative that the audience, nobody knows how it's gonna end. There's no, pre, there's no script, there's no plot. It's just gonna happen. Someone's gonna win, someone's gonna lose, someone's gonna get crushed. And uh, there's something kind of exciting about that, plus uh, both American and international sports are so huge. How has that on been the, different for you coming out of- On a business level, the- <laughs> What was interesting, when I first came from Searchlight, I went to the broadcast network and I wasn't doing sports, but I was doing American Idol. And the level of adrenaline that you get broadcasting a live event 
is just astonishing. Like you sit in the production booth and there's sort of 30 cameras going and it's going out live to 30 million homes and it's just cranking. Um, and sports is the same thing because you have, you know, at one of our NFL games, we might have 40 cameras and you have to capture every moment. You can't, you can't miss a great play and say, so, so, oh, whoops, you know, the camera didn't catch it. So you have this, it's so adrenalized and the level of technique and technology that you bring to try and bring fans closer to the game. And Fox has always prided ourselves on, on, on really making innovation and bringing people into the game in a way where you really feel like you're there. You use sound in a way where you, you know, you, every pound, every hit, you hear it. Um, so it's incredibly uh, creative in a way that it doesn't appear because you're just presenting something that's factual but everything is better with a story. So every sporting event has you know, heroes and villains and narrative and a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's sort of a perfect three-act structure. And you know, in this country, I don't know whether you follow English football. So last mm. season, this tiny little underdog called Leicester City like, won, mm. win the Premier League. And you know, Jose Mourinho was an amazingly perfect villain because you know, his team had won the year before you know, and he was fired and out by December. So you don't know what's going to happen. And I think that element of surprise has been lost a little bit in scripted drama because people have now watched so much that they, they can guess what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's like, I've seen this storyline before. And sports, you don't get that. And, and you're interfacing with the teams, with the owners, with the, with the different divisions, whether it be the... Uh, 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 soccer, we, we call it soccer or football, or, uh, or domestic, you know, or American, sorry, and domestic, where am I? I'm jet lagged far. Um, but uh, with uh, American, but, and they're also different, the sport, you would seem their personalities are different. Have you found that? Do you, do, you, are you, do you get heavily involved or do you? Well, the leagues and the teams, it's an interesting dynamic in many ways not dissimilar to the dynamic that you have over a long period of time with a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. they're, they're better relationships when they've existed for 25 years. Like there's a level of transparency and trust that you can build up. And you know, these teams and leagues have existed for longer than our television network. Mm -hmm. And they'll you know, exist far into the future without us. And so that's a very different dynamic from you know, the traditional, you know, I'm going to hire you to do this, and you're going to do what we tell you. Um, really, you know, we end up doing what the NFL tell us. It's not the other okay. way around. Um, but it, so it's a it's a it's a huge business, and it's fun. Yeah, it's that's what fun. I was. Uh, I, I... Well, I think we've run out of time. Thanks um, for listening to us. Thank you guys very <laughs> much for coming. Thank you for um, taking the time to listen to us. We have to thank um, the people who sponsored the panel today, which was the British Film Commission and. The Creative Society. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Creative Scotland. Creative Scotland. Sorry. Thank I, you very much, Creative Scotland. Thank you, Creative Scotland. Um,